Someone once said that you can find out more about a person by what they throw away than by anything else. Well, if that's true, this pile of stuff says quite a lot about us, I imagine. It's a display of what's no longer useful, what's obsolete, a reflection of how things age and the measure of our successes and failures. Now, there's a great deal of energy being spent as I speak on dealing with waste disposal, but waste problems can't really be solved here. Real solutions must begin with the design of our products. Appropriate design can deal with such problems long before they get here. How? Well, let's start by looking at something that influences the creation of garbage more than anything else, time itself. You see, everything that was once new will get old or die or break or crumble to dust. Time and use wears things out. Time reflects the cumulative effects of nature and the elements we talked of in earlier programs. Time renders things obsolete. Time often seems in short supply, but still it marches on. And for appropriate design, the effects of time are extensive. In this program, I'll be trying to make sense of them. Everything from maintenance to fashion, from things that break completely to things that must be repaired, from things that need restoration to those that become obsolete. That also means we must talk about how to control these effects, from resource management to waste management and everything in between quite a lot to cover. We won't be talking about new ways to reuse old peanut butter jars, no, but we will try to put together some appropriate criteria to help make better sense of what we design, how we consume, and how to deal best with the inevitable effects of time. So let's begin by looking at the history of product development. For the first few centuries of design and manufacture, the emphasis was to produce things that worked and then to make them reliable and durable. The effects of time were understood through experience and a whole lot of failures. Remember, when we look at antiques, we are seeing the survivors. We no longer have all the failures. For a long time, we assumed that the planet Earth was just a big ball ready to be explored and exploited. Once we learnt to deal with its climatic idiosyncrasies and to exploit its potential to feed us, this attitude gained momentum. We made mistakes, but we could always move on to pastures new. Without knowing it, we were already starting to do irreparable damage. The growth in population and technology in the last 200 years has accelerated, and we are still making mistakes. Now we have a hole in the ozone layer, chlorofluorocarbons, the greenhouse effect, acid rain destroying natural symbiotic balances that have remained intact for centuries, and all kinds of waste that we have nowhere to put, and in many cases, no means to render it harmless to the environment. The fact is, we're a little out of control. But by focusing on making less waste and taking a better approach to design, we can help in the transition from overconsumption to conservation and will eventually aid rather than limit our development. An area in which we can begin to re-evaluate our approach concerns the maintenance and repair of our products, an activity which doesn't seem to have the same importance it once did. These old shoes are just worn out. Impossible to repair and anyway, they're out of fashion. But I can still picture the owner getting out the shoe polish and carefully cleaning and shining these to look sharp for the dance on a Saturday night. Because although part of the process of cleaning the shoes was maintenance, it was also inspection to see if the heels needed repair. But shoes these days often have moulded soles and they can't be repaired. They may also be plastic coated. So we never clean them, so we don't inspect them either. It's amazing to realise just how often maintenance was demanded of us in our daily lives. We had no option. We had to wind clocks, change spark plugs and oil, put a new needle in the record player, top up the battery, sharpen pencils, put ink in our pens, clean the silver, polish the brass, defrost the fridge, hand wash the clothes, then iron them clean the oven, polish the furniture, sharpen our razors, wash diapers, all necessary maintenance. We still do some of these things, of course, but the point is, we don't have to. You could say, thank goodness, thank goodness we don't have to do all that anymore. If we had to do that all the time, we wouldn't get anything else done. Well, that is one of the benefits of good design, the removal of drudgery. However, while maintenance may be time-consuming, it had another benefit. 
Maintenance helped us to understand how something worked, which parts wear out, how something fits together, even how it was made in the first place. We got a feel for materials, for the weight of things. So when anything broke, we tried to fix it. In those mechanical days, you could take a screwdriver, take the back or cover off the appliance and inspect the damage. Because of the demands of maintenance, we were rich in the knowledge of the things we used. We learnt clues to all manner of things. But now design is more sophisticated. We're too busy to do maintenance, especially with all the breakthroughs in technology. Things that once were wood are now plastic. Things that once were mechanical are now electronic. Things that once were big are now small. We not only need smaller screwdrivers, but a PhD in electronic engineering to repair something these days. Not only that, but the manufacturers don't want us to mess with the thing anymore. Send it off to an approved repairer person. Sometimes we can't send it, so we pay for someone to come. That's expensive, and it's embarrassing when it turns out to be a fuse costing peanuts, and the house call costs 50 times as much. And now that may be very nice for the repair person, but the fact is that such complaints, and they are not uncommon, are wasteful and a sign of poor design, a waste of time and energy. So one way design can help cure the disease of consumptive waste is to help users understand the things they use. This means not only how the product should be used, but what to do when something breaks or wears out, what we can do to repair the worn out part, how to replace components, what can be safely replaced and what can't or shouldn't, when to change things and how. All these factors should be evident and be communicated to the user by the design itself. In other words, if the products are designed with the users in mind, then the manufacturers get the users on their side. If not, we get a lot of products that become obsolete before they need to. A product could become obsolete for one or more of these three reasons. It can break irreparably. A bottle gets smashed. Tissues get used. Or it can become technologically outdated, like this old mechanical calculator, which has been superseded by the smaller and quicker electronic calculator. Or it can become aesthetically obsolete, like bell bottoms, or big fins on cars. These are the factors that designers, manufacturers, and consumers must understand. For instance, while high fashion clothing need only last as long as the fashion, a product like a stove should have an aesthetic that can last as long as it can work too, and not become aesthetically obsolete prematurely. A thing that breaks should be designed so that it is repairable, to optimise its useful life. So this is where we can learn from our experience and judge value not as just the initial purchase price, but as an overall value throughout its life. We can put a time value on a product. We can not only design it so that it can be used appropriately, we can also design a product with a life expectancy in mind and its eventual impact on the environment as waste taken into account. This is, of course, easier to say than do. For example, perhaps the most difficult type of obsolescence to avoid is that brought about by technology itself. In recent years, computer and electronic technology has changed so rapidly that waste due to technological obsolescence has been enormous. Cameras, 8-track players, record players, calculators, computers become obsolete in a short time. Today, however, a product can only be made cost-effective if it has a life expectancy of several years. Companies simply can't afford to constantly change the design of their products. As a consequence, we are seeing longer warranties. But with many other products, obsolescence has become part of an overall marketing strategy. All these items are said to be throwaways. Use them, then throw them away. But there's nothing stopping anyone from throwing anything away. Our shoes, our clothes, our radio, our car. Yes. Why not throw away our car? Well, some of us actually do. At some point, it's just not worth spending more money on it. So we might sell some parts and get someone to tow away the rest. The steel body is usually crunched up and is to some extent recycled. So a car is never really a total throwaway. In fact, the complete throwaway is really just a marketing device. Probably one of marketing's greatest creative inventions. Just think of all the advantages it gives to the manufacturer. 
They make a product, it works, the customer buys it and uses it until it stops working. Then, it's thrown away. And here come the benefits. The manufacturer doesn't have to set up a repair network. No need for spare parts, no need for screws for assembly and reassembly, no safety concerns. The manufacturer isn't even responsible for what is thrown away, so long as it worked reasonably well in the first place and for a reasonable length of time. And the customer may well come back to buy another one. Like this cigarette lighter. Or this flashlight. After all, a throwaway one is bound to be cheaper than a repairable one. Or is it? After all, this flashlight has all the same parts as this one. And in the long run, putting new batteries in this one may well work out cheaper than buying two or three of these. But advertising people don't tell you that. Why not? Well, to answer that, we have to go back to the 50s, the so-called days of plenty. That's when some of our bad habits began. In those expansive days, marketing people started to get worried because we were making things too well. There was a danger that industry and creativity would stagnate. So they started to stress the notion of throwing away last year's model and buying this year's planned obsolescence. Change was considered good, and yet products were generally reliable. So it became a conscious act to design something so that it would become obsolete. Chrysler-made cars will offer highway hi-fi that plays disc music through the radio of the car. The manufacturer claims that this new kind of balanced tone arm will stay in the groove on the roughest road. Through the powers of advertising, we were all seduced to consume more and more. And that legacy is with us today. Deliberate obsolescence in the throwaway product is taken for granted. Mind you, that's not to say that all throwaway products are wrong. This razor lasts maybe a week. This pen writes about eight kilometers. These shoes last about a year. Toothpaste dispensers, two weeks. This toothbrush, three months. This plastic cup, this hamburger box, this coffee filter, plastic cutlery, this tissue, all used once and thrown away. On the other hand, this sink lasts about 10 years or more. This saucepan, about the same. So how do we know which are sensible products and which are not? I mean, is there some rationale to justify the existence of the throwaway product? Well, probably the best way to answer this is to break it down into a list of costs. Not purely fixed monetary costs, but, well, let me explain. For any product, the manufacturer must cover the costs for research, development and design, raw materials and manufacture, packaging and shipping, marketing and sales activities, and the creation of maintenance, repair, and spare part networks. For society, there's the environmental cost of using up energy and non-renewable resources, costs to our health from industrial pollution, costs related to value, including repair and maintenance, costs for waste disposal, and costs to support the complete system from the setting up of government agencies to building roads. Although the costs for manufacturers, consumers and society are not the same, they must interrelate. And when all the costs for a product are taken into account, it may well be advisable to produce or not produce a throwaway product. For example, the alternative to disposable tissues is a cotton handkerchief, which is less hygienic, with washing costs, soap, electricity, water, polluted seaways, far outweighing those of the tissue. So to help determine the level of acceptable waste, we must look at and balance all the costs. But the only way to ensure that this is done is through the law, which is another can of worms. If a manufacturer wants to make something, then as long as the laws of pollution and safety, etc. are not being broken, then the manufacturer is free to do so. And we as consumers have a similar right. We can buy and use whatever we want. If I want to leave my lights on all night and can pay the bill, I can. If I want to throw away my car when the ashtray is full, I can. Ridiculous, of course. But the point is that no one can be forced into not throwing something away, unless there are laws and fines. But can you see someone being fined for using too much electricity? Well, I suppose it could happen in the future. It is just a difference in degree that could force laws to make manufacturers responsible for cleaning up their waste products. For example, how about a five cent deposit on a disposable razor? 
It works for beer and soft drink bottles. So why not for other items too, even those that cannot be recycled? But would we bother carefully sorting everything and taking it all back to the appropriate place? Wouldn't we still just throw these things away? The question of who pays for dealing with waste becomes even more complex when a government wants to impose strict pollution standards on one of the manufacturing companies. The extra costs involved could make that company non-competitive in the marketplace. In such situations, clearly, there would then need to be global standards. Hopefully, we are heading that way. So while some waste may be acceptable, the focus must remain on reducing waste. Another approach is, of course, recycling the materials of old products into new products. Now, the trouble with the word cycle is that it implies a complete loop, where something starts out and eventually comes back to where it began. But this is not entirely true. You see, when a so-called cycle occurs, something is inevitably lost. For instance, to move the bicycle wheel back to where it began takes energy. So in most cases, things that come back to the starting point are never quite the same. It's all part of an inevitable process that will eventually lead us to wear out or exhaust this planet. So the key to good design where cycles are involved, be they life cycles or so-called recycles, is to be aware of not just what is being gained as a benefit, but what is being lost as a consequence. Now to recycle paper and almost anything, energy is involved. Energy to sort out the paper and put it in a bin, energy to transport it, to grind it into a pulp, to remove impurities like dirt and dust and ink, and finally, energy to reconstitute it into paper. But the most significant fact is that when fine quality paper is recycled, it comes back as a second quality paper, which would then recycle as, say, newsprint. While some bottles may be cleaned and then reused, like pop bottles, this is not the case for other bottles and jars. There is no standardization, because there is no incentive to do so. But glass can be recycled, which involves sorting, crushing, separating out any impurities, remelting and moulding. Recycled glass is, like paper, a second-grade material and cannot be used for refined purposes, such as good crystal glass. Aluminum cans can also be recycled. They, too, are remelted to make other aluminum products. Just like paper and glass, the recycled aluminum is used for less refined demands, such as the casting of beams and more aluminum cans. Plastics, however, are a different story and a paradox. On the plus side, plastics offer us many ways that help keep items separate and fresh, prevents smelly contamination. Without plastics and their inert characteristics, hygiene standards worldwide would drop astronomically. However, the big problem is that plastics do not biodegrade, so there's little or no chance of their contents being neutralised. Or well, they may tear apart after a while, but they remain as plastic. Relying mostly on oil for their existence, they lock up carbon forever, and carbon is a critical element to our existence, and we need to be careful how we use it. Or we are now just developing plastics derived from other sources that don't lock up the carbon forever. Soya, for example. But until they are available as a viable alternative, we could continue to use paper bags or use tougher, reusable plastic bags. So instead of using them once, we might take them with us to the supermarket and when we've used them, wash them for next time. Or it can be done if we want to. They could certainly be designed that way. There's still another problem with plastic to solve. There are so many types of plastic that if we were to try to recycle one, how would we know which type of plastic it was? You see, plastics don't like being mixed with different plastics. The more unique the plastic, the less it wants to combine with other plastics. And on top of that, plastic like paper gets contaminated in use and it can't always be cheaply sterilized by steam because it might melt. So you see, there's no easy solution. This milk jug will be a milk jug just once. When it's reground, it won't be of an acceptable grade for use as a food container. 
One new idea involves having the manufacturers label all plastic products with a symbol that indicates what plastic it is made from. This will better the chance of reuse in one form or another. And when looking at reusing products, we can learn a few lessons from clothes. These are out of date, out of fashion. What happens to them? Well, they could be handed on to someone else, or they could be altered. They could even come into fashion again, perhaps with a new twist. Or they could be sorted and shredded to produce mixed fibres to be used as fillers, or padding, or just cheaper fabrics. So it is really an attitude. An attitude that designs things with reuse in mind, and an attitude that consumers can apply, that will ensure that the maximum use is got out of the product before it eventually becomes waste. This means designing products with their entire life cycle in mind. This graph represents value in the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis, and everything that has ever been made could be represented by this graph. Raw material itself starts off with a certain value, which increases as it is made into a product. Over a period of use, it wears out or goes out of fashion until it declines to a value roughly the same as it started with. It could, of course, break irreparably before that point and its value would plunge. Or it could simply decline still further and become useless waste. But it could instead be caught at a critical point and the waste reduced by reprocessing it into a new product and regain value. Or it could be upgraded, repaired, or simply acquire second-hand value. These are the options that should be considered when the product is designed in the first place. Less predictable options include a return to fashion, gaining value as an antique, or even as a national treasure or museum piece. You see, this graph represents not only a glass bottle, but also an old purse, an antique clock, and even a marble statue. The new attitude to design takes into account this life cycle. As a consequence, we are seeing more products made using sub-assemblies, such as our washerless faucet or the batteries in the flashlight. The best example, though, is the bike. The design of the bicycle hasn't changed much in the last 50 years. Look at mine. Now, there are new materials and improved gears and tyres, but the bike is still basically a bike. Although the early bicycles had no gears, they already looked like the bicycles we see today. So it is hardly a new invention. In fact, there have been, and are, many ways to design a two-wheeled, human-powered vehicle with tension cables and wheels of all sizes. But we keep coming back to the basic bike because the design of a bicycle makes sense. Let me run through a few features. First, everything is easy to see and have access to. We can learn how it works because we can see it working. So we can check and maintain it easily. There are parts to clean, parts that need grease, and there is a great deal of straightforwardness about the design too. The shapes honestly reflect function, materials, and how the bicycle is made and put together. And there's more. Now, all the components on this bicycle are made by a range of manufacturers, but all the parts fit. Wheels fit forks, brakes align with rims, chains fit gears and sprockets, handlebars fit stems and stems fit frames, regardless of who made them or even which country they were made in. A friend of mine has had the same bicycle for 30 years. He's put on new tyres. New gears, a new wheel, changed the seat, worn out the brake blocks a few times, but it's still the same bicycle. Well, sort of. A great example of sub-assembly based design. And there is still more. You see, every component on a bicycle is specifically designed for its function. And most are made of a single material ideally suited to that function. Rubber for tyres and brake blocks. Leather or plastic as a seat. Chrome steel or aluminum for brakes. If necessary, reuse or reprocessing would be possible. So the bicycle represents very successful design and follows a similar formula all over the world. As technology accelerates, as life gets more competitive and complex, the onus is on the designers to help us make sense of it all and open up new potential, but not to lose the sound, basic values that make up our particular culture. Appropriate design can take care of these things. 
In the next programme, we'll be looking at another type of product that we can learn a lot from. Toys. And what they can tell us about appropriate design. See you then. <laughs>